<clears throat> so good afternoon and great speech, I thought. Um, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about the very near future and how some of the principles that Dave was alluding to are becoming a reality today. And since this is a business summit, to talk a little bit about the opportunities that they may create for us all in the process. I'm not going to talk about our urban challenge right now. I think it's fairly obvious to anybody who reads a newspaper or spends any time on the web. But the acceleration of urbanization is probably the most profound thing we have to challenge. Uh, <clears throat> when we move into cities, we move uh, and use multiple resources, multiple times the number of resources that we live when we've lived in rural environments. So we have a natural resource problem. But also, we're starting to see the hyper-competitivity between cities as a measurement of the technological evolution of whole states, where GDP is measured in a few places, not looking at the collective. And some of the conversations this morning is a great reflection how London is becoming hyper-competitive in areas of technology. We have a couple of challenges. The first thing I always hear, I've been, I formed the company seven years ago. How do we afford this technology? How do we afford to be sustainable? Who's going to pay that extra capital? And I've got three ideas, and I've got a set of conclusions. The first is that today, everything we do is very siloed. When you look at building today, it's governed by um, business uh, building codes, by government departments. Water is disconnected from energy, is disconnected from every other infrastructure component. We build products in silos, nothing connects together. Everything is proprietary. It makes it difficult for small businesses to innovate. It makes it very difficult for us to move out of legacy. So a huge shift has to be the rationalization of that. When you start to think about energy production, let's say on a building, and I've got surplus energy and I now have to store it somewhere, my building can no longer contain it. I have to look at the urban space as a set of battery resources and it might be I move water from a lagoon uphill and take it out in microhydro. I might use wireless energy sources to pass that into automotive batteries and extract it. I may turn it into ice. I may turn it into kinetic energy. All of those resources become connected via the network through actuation and through sensing. Critical piece. Second thing, we're going to spend something like 17 to $18 trillion over the next 10, 15 years in building new places. Everybody thinks that this is a trend that is only affecting the developing world, but actually London has grown by 58% over the last 15 years. And we have a massive regeneration issue. The developing world has an advantage when it lays down new infrastructure, it's moving to the next phase of technology, whereas when we walk around London today, there's lots of things that we have to renew, regenerate to be competitive. To get there, we have to start applying techniques that we've learned in other sectors. And today, the real estate and construction sector is the least efficient sector of all sectors, and yet it's the second largest capital market uh, behind government and defense. And so we think about that. One is an opportunity for business to reinvent in terms of scale a business opportunity and as a technologist. This is the largest single market we ever faced, and it's all near term. It's not 20, 30 years ago. It's problematic now. People are moving. When you look at uh, the manufacturing industries, they typically use a, a methodology, a product life cycle me methodology, where they look at how things will work for the long run. They look at the economic model over 50, 60, 70 years of running those assets, and then they design back into the engineering uh, those capacities. This is an example relating to a development that we're leading in, in Portugal uh, with a fairly large city that hopefully will get out of the ground in the next few years. But we simulated about 15,000 economic, social, environmental, and other factors to figure out how to use the land. The net effect was a reduction of 12% in the infrastructure cost, an increase in density but not in heights of buildings, and an overall improvement in many, very area, many areas. Here, for example, we're simulating how do we locate services so that within three minutes, somebody living in that city can access all of the general services, including their workplace. If you create that three-minute walk twice a day, you reduce half, uh, heart issues by about 50%. And so there are health impacts as well as finance impacts as well as OPEX impacts. 
Last one is actually looking at building heights and varying them with the topography so I can accelerate air across the top of the building so I can convert into much higher values of micro uh, wind generation and slow the air down on the ground so that I can keep it cool and I don't blow grandmothers off their feet when they're going into buildings. Here's an example of product life cycle manufacturing applied to a fantastic uh, piece of architecture and building in China. Going from the modeling side to the software, pulling the pieces apart and figuring out how to fabricate, to developing a manufacturing system that can be decomposed and then reassembled on site, to figuring out do I build it with a human hand or do I do it with robotics and the trade-off in the various costs. How are the systems going to function? How do they really function in that virtual environment, effectively running the building before you ever lay a brick? Looking at the manufacturing process, where does my crane go, where do I deliver my materials, how do I assemble it, in what order, with what resources, it's all about compressing the amount of time and the amount of capital. So that capital can be reapplied to more sophisticated materials and technology and drive the density that Dave was referring to, where everything is connected and everything interrelates. The third factor is this industrialization of the internet. We've had three major waves. We had the publishing web, we had the interactive web, and we're actually jumping beyond just simple semantics into this industrialized phase. Today, except in certain applications, it's impossible for us to completely rely on the internet to manage critical tasks. If I had a heart issue and I was reliant on the electronics and the compute power disconnected from me, and I was relying on connectivity and processing distributed, I would probably feel just a little bit nervous today. We've not got to the point where we can fundamentally rely on this as a utility, a completely robust and redundant utility. But we're shifting. Uh, we've done some work with um, McLaren. We've developed some technology, which I'll explain in a moment. But effectively, instead of having building control systems infrastructure control systems, all of this very complex, very proprietary technology. We have to converge controls at the very edge of the network so that we've got the maximized compute power, the maximum amount of redundancy, the most amount of flexibility. Where the three things take us is what we call the city of things. It's when suddenly you invert how you think about a city as a set of physical building blocks, but a convergence of those virtual services with the fabric of the very cities in which we live. Now think of it this way. Um, I have a uh, mobile phone. Uh, my Microsoft or former Microsoft colleagues will not be impressed. It's an iPhone. And um, on this phone, I have a couple of different apps, and I'll just pull up one healthcare app. I'll show you the most boring of them first um, because it's, it's more visual. This is an application that is I'm going to turn on my light on the back of my phone. And uh, when I put my finger on it, it's basically lighting up my finger. And every time my finger pulses, it gets darker. And so it can figure out that's my pulse. Now, this is a bit more invasive. What I can't show you because I'm not plugged into the camera, it's a less invasive version where Philips have developed an application where the camera sensor is providing a set of data that's being analyzed, and in the 24 phases of the video frame, I can see your face flushes every time your heart beats. So I can give you your pulse, and I can look at facial structure and figure out when you're breathing. And when you look at the seven or eight sensors and devices on here, and yet the two billion apps that have been developed and deployed, you start to see the value of a small number of sensors somewhere. When I look at a city surface, you're talking about three to 4,000 different classes of sensors and actuators. And I subdivide them again into more specialist areas. So if I could expose that data up and allow the software industry and hardware industry, but the software industry to innovate on it, there are some obvious applications. And if you look at this thing, we have a thing called the urban operating system. I'm not going to bore you with it right now. But basically, it controls and operates cities to take the, the load on natural resources down dramatically by integrating energy, water, waste, transportation, logistics, those types of things. 
Really what it has done is converged all sensing and actuation with network hardware. In this case, it happens to be Cisco equipment with our special source inside it. And then on top of that, we have this spatial understanding because everybody thinks about time series data when they think about sensing. But actually, without the context of physical space and the physics of both materials and environment, you can't really make sense of three sensors in close proximity that may be being impacted by some other physical factor. So spatial is very important. On top you see the process of designing a city, simulating a city, fabricating its components, and in the process of final assembly, you're introducing a massive density of sensing, actuating, and network infrastructure, blending with the materials of that assembly. So typically you're looking at a 20, 30, 40% cost reduction in the construction of the building. And so you can increase the level of density of the technology significantly. And on average, a general building will have less than half a percent of its capital goes to technology. And so people make trade-offs all the time. Secondly, it runs for cheaper, which means I can deploy it and maintain it for a long while. And finally, buildings are sort of dead on arrival today. Their structures are keep us warm and dry. But if I can continually augment the capabilities of a building by layering on new applications that leverage the sensing and actuation, I can get buildings that support my economic and social development interests in a way that we've never seen before. This is not 20 years from now. This is happening now. We're involved in a bunch of projects. The scale of the opportunity for manufacturers, for innovators, for entrepreneurs, for financiers is quite staggering. One of the things that we've been working on uh, here in, in London with the support of the Technology Strategy Board and some of our other partners, Cisco and Fusion and the likes, is developing the first instance in London of these types of capacities. And we actually are developing this inside of the Greenwich, on the Greenwich Peninsula. And we're working with hundreds and hundreds of enterprises who are starting to find new ways in everything from turning light posts into hubs of communication and new forms of applications to the way we control the physical spaces around us. And it touches every industry vertical. When you think of smart cities, what you effectively have is the, the consolidation of many industry verticals. It doesn't matter whether it's happening in commercial space, or that blends with your home, whether it's education, whether it's health. We disintermediate some things and we re-aggregate, and the platform underneath is basically the network and its data. It's an exciting project for those here, but also those around the world. But these are starting to appear very aggressively in every country around the world. And those who get there first, build the industries to export, to innovate, will set the standards very early in the game. The market will be won or lost in the next five years. And hopefully, um, the battle for our environment will be won or lost uh, in our cities too. Thank you.